Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Ellig, the CEO and founder of Ellig Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our long-standing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am delighted to welcome Lily Yil Valletta, the co-founder and CEO of the global cultural intelligence market research tech firm, Culture Intel, and the cultural marketing agency, CN Plus. Lily is an award-winning entrepreneur, recognized cultural intelligence expert, AI tech innovator, and World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. After a successful corporate career, including 10 years with Johnson & Johnson, where she pioneered diversity strategies, Lily co-founded CN Plus and Cultural Intel. She is a regular TV commentator, the recipient of numerous awards, a champion of advancing women and underrepresented groups, as indicated by many initiatives that she has collaborated on with the United Nations and the White House. She currently serves as a board member of the Harvard Women's Leadership Board, the National Board of Directors of the YMCA USA, mentor to the Stanford Latino Entrepreneur Leaders Program, and gubernatorial appointment to the New York State Council on Women and Girls, and mayoral appointment to the New York City Leadership Council. Given this is Women's History Month, I am delighted to welcome Lily Gilvaletta, a true champion for women. Lily, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Janice. I always enjoy these conversations with you. It's a pleasure. And we have had many in terms of mm -hmm. how to really move the needle for women in underrepresented groups. And I've seen you innovate in so many different venues, in boardrooms, in front of clients, and working on projects with me. I've so admired how you put so much into action. But let's start at the beginning, when you immigrated from your native country, Colombia, to the U.S. at the age of 17, leaving your entire family behind and not knowing any English. <laughs> you truly got out of your comfort zone and at such an early age. Describe what that was like and how it yeah. <laughs> strengthened your resolve to make a difference on this planet. It was the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, my parents gave me the opportunity to come to the States to learn how to speak English. So I was only going to be here for a year. And a year has now turned into more than 30 for sure. <laughs> and a great journey uh, of living the American dream. So for me, it was, I guess it, it taught me uh, how to mature very quickly and recognize that there was a cultural advantage. And instead of getting annoyed by it, Janice, I was encouraged to educate and fill the gaps for others and tell them more about my culture and why it was different and how we had more in common than they thought. And, and I guess that warmed me up for the career I eventually had in, in corporate America and now in cultural intelligence, helping some of the biggest brands around the world understand that there is power in culture and inclusion so that we can really tap into the full potential of business and people in that process. So it was, uh, it, it was hard, but I was, uh, I guess it, it helped me recognize what I was made of. And here we are still talking about culture. Tell our audience, what is the value proposition of each and how do, how do you benefit clients, you know, mm -hmm. through these two companies and help them drive those purposeful profits while still having a concern for people. That's exactly right. So uh, CM Plus, for those of you that speak Spanish, you may know that that's the number 100. And it's kind of a play of words because we believe at our companies that it is mathematically impossible for any organization to achieve their full potential in business and in impact without cultural intelligence embedded into everything they do. Hence the CN Plus. So CN Plus is the consultancy and marketing side of our business where some of the biggest brands and corporations around the world reach out to us and our expertise so that we can give them the data, the strategy, and the go-to-market and marketing um, campaigns and messaging and approach that they need to be culturally relevant in today's very fast-changing market. But what makes your 
process difference? You're not talking about just focus groups or just social media. This is really getting what's on the minds of employees and customers. Yeah, that's correct. So we've been really busy during this season of COVID because if we have learned anything in the last two years is that there's never a constant. And the proverbial new normal, I think, will never be normal, normal. It's an ever-changing reality. It's a new reality, more so than a new normal. And in that capacity, so to answer your question, Janice, we are actually harvesting or scraping every single digital discussion that people volunteer everywhere in real time. Um, and that happens in blogs, in topical sites, in news sites. The comments that are on a news article or a YouTube video, all of that is open source digital voices of people that are expressing how they feel or react to a certain topic without a researcher asking them anything on a survey or a poll or a question. And that is very, very rich. It goes beyond social networks where many times there's a lot of chatter or noise or bots. Um, I'll give you an example. We did a, a scraping of conversations about people just talking about their relationship to the workplace. And that was 28 million digital discussions specific to how they evaluated their, their workplace and their jobs. And social media was barely 12% of those data sources. So it's not social listening. Sure, there's things that happen there, but people are a lot more open in the anonymity of Quora, for example, or comments in Indeed or uh, Glassdoor or job sites that they get to be someone that is not their full name and therefore candidly and unsolicited openly share how they feel. So that's what's so unique. And we take all of that, organize it to look at patterns. And those patterns reveal the voice of the people, what matters to them, what's driving culture or frustration or loyalty to the places where they work or how they feel about a brand or a product. So that's what makes it so different. The sources are so vast and global that we don't limit ourselves to just a few list of destinations. Specifically, you and I have worked, because I'm in the search industry, on the talent factor, right? And really what's on the minds of those employees. So for companies who aren't doing this, who don't have that cultural intelligence mindset or driver with the data that you can provide, what's what's missing and how do you close the gaps? When I get to talk to uh, the CEOs or the C-suite that trust us to do this work, I, I tell them, you know, the same discipline that we have in understanding our customers, right? The world of tech, for example, is obsessed with personalization um, and understanding those user personas so that you provide a, a catered experience where you are meeting the needs of customers. Well, the same thing ought to happen for how you're designing policy and organizational dynamics of your people, which people tend to say, oh, people are your biggest asset. No, they're not just your asset. They're your company. And our ability to understand the unique needs of, let's say, the workforce and the uniqueness within that workforce mix, right? Because you have millennials, you have boomers, you have Gen Xers, you have men, women, Hispanic, Black, Asian, LGBTQ+. And that could be quite overwhelming because then CDOs or chief, you know, ex-officers would say, well, how do I design policy or programs or engagement strategies for so many diverse segments of workforce? Well, that is where we come into play. So with, uh, for example, a, a big, big financial institution, we were able to look at drivers and barriers to that entity as a place to work across all those diverse segments men, women, Hispanic, Black, Asian. And guess what? The drivers to engagement or satisfaction are not always the same across all segments. When you have personalization in the data that helps you understand how you are perceived as a place to work and also as a corporate citizen, 
and as a provider of products and services, it redefines, using your words, it reimagines how we design policy and engagement initiatives that are not a one-size-fits-all. And I think that's what's so exciting in the work that we do and I know we've done with you is to be able to have an intervention map that is no longer cookie cutter, but personalized to the diversity within the workforce that we serve, because we do as C-suite leaders serve our people so that the company itself stays sticky and relevant, especially now that we know the dynamics with great resignation, hybrid work, remote, et cetera, that has shifted the expectations of people. And without the data to inform that, we may be making a lot of assumptions that leave some of key cohorts behind. I've listened to one of your TED Talks recently, and in there you really talked about being aware. So the cultural intelligence makes you aware of what the issues are for various age groups, ethnic groups, you know, um, all sorts of uh, differences in people, and then you know, how that may change once you understand how it may change your policies. And so you have to apply those. And in the TED Talk, and I'm quoting you, Lily, <laughs> diversity is overrated because companies have underestimated diversity. And, you know, I've titled the program today, The Power of Cultural Intelligence, Return on Inclusion, your ROI, right? So if you're culturally aware, you will have more profits because people will be included at all levels, representing the communities you serve, employees and customers, investors, everybody. So elaborate on how companies can change this DEI paradigm. Yes, there is a lot of conversation about diversity. However, I do feel that if we continue in the pursuit of representation, right? Like check the box, do I have the right color chips on the table? without truly creating an inclusive approach to business, those colorful chips may not be able to fully express their color or may just leave because checking the box of representation, which is typically what diversity addresses, without an inclusive design to your business will not last. So that is the premise of that TED Talk. And the definition of, of it with cultural intelligence is really what we need is because uh, to me, cultural intelligence is three verbs, uh, Janice, is being aware of, understand, and apply cultural competence and inclusive data into your everyday business. And a lot of people are aware, which sometimes with diversity and even some of the implicit bias trainings, which I think they're great, they make you aware But if you don't graduate from understanding what that means for you and your organization, and certainly if you don't apply it, which is third action verb, it becomes just a nice academic exercise. And diversity, unfortunately, in many cases, continues to be stuck in the box of altruism or as a a very good article from Harvard Business Review said, it called it vanity metrics or Uh, compliance theater. And again, these are some other experts' words, not just mine. (laughs) You lose on its full value. And this is where I take it very pragmatic. I'm like, okay, is it the right thing to do? Sure. But it's the smart thing to do for shareholder value and for your company to stay viably competitive. Why? Because women make 80% of purchasing decisions. And if you're losing them at a higher rate than other professionals, and still have gaps in leadership, you may be having a blind spot that could have a quicker path to those chief purchasing decision leaders of your customer base that may be underdeveloped or underserved. And at the same time, if the shifting demographics of our country are showing that by the year 2040 will be majority minority as a nation, and those are the segments driving the fastest you know, rate of population growth and buying power, Black, Hispanic, Asian, et cetera. But you don't have a strategy that understands what that means to your business, not to your dashboard of how many, you know, people I have of a certain background, 
No, your actual investment decisions, new product development, you know, market uh, strategies, then you'll be missing out on what's driving all growth and represents almost 50% of the American population. So that's why in my TED Talk, I go into really challenging where we place diversity in the business priority buckets that CEOs and, and you know, leaders are juggling. And it cannot just be the altruistic mission, maybe CSR initiative or a public statement that lives in a letter that the president put out because, you know, George Floyd, which was horrific, happened. It goes beyond that into the application and what that means in the way you're making policy, culture, and investment and budget decisions. That's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, and clearly from a search perspective, you know, we're at the executive level and building teams under executives. And for the boardroom, we really need to bring in and over hire and continue to bring uh, underrepresented groups and women up the ranks. Because as I look at the boardrooms, you know, you're one of less than 3% of Latinos serving on a public board. But you had that training to be able to serve on a public board. We need to bring in more uh, at lower levels and bring them up the ranks, right? And then put them into the C-suite and then have them in the boardroom. So as a public board director, how are you using your position to push for more representation of diverse women on boards? And do you have any perspective on how we can accelerate that glacial progress? I love this question, Janice. I, I do pinch myself when I look at the stats, um, as you mentioned, is less than 3% that are Hispanic independent directors, but less than 1% are Hispanic females. So it becomes this needle in a haystack, but it doesn't have to be that. So there's, let me break this down in three parts, my answer. So number one is I feel that companies, and I know there are states where now this is in legislation, like my, my public board sits in Seattle. So Washington state actually has a law that requires at least a third uh, representation of women on the board, but it shouldn't just be about hitting that metric. Once again, if we believe the numbers of buying power of women, which they, they control 80% of all purchasing decisions, but also recognize, right, what I just said about shifting demographics, that diverse segments are driving 100% of population growth, then you get really diligent about having an accelerated pipeline that makes people not C-suite or bore ready. I feel like we need to reinvent that word too. But that starts making people of these backgrounds that represent all growth, C-suite and board capable. So it's starting to recognize potential sooner instead of always falling back into that checklist that maybe will disqualify candidates that may be capable today, but maybe because they haven't been on a public board yet or have not held a C-suite title per se to make it to a board that they get disqualified when the capabilities on the work experience they've had makes them very capable, maybe need a little bit more coaching or a mentor, uh, a peer mentor on a board or in those executive ranks in a company that want to continue to promote people up. So it needs reinvention altogether. But it's not because it's a token or a favor. It's because it will make you better as a business. And the numbers are there to prove it. So in my case, what I have done, Janice, and this is, uh, I will put it on the record now. What it took was somebody like you, right, who was a, a, a member of the YMCA board, which even though it's a non-for-profit, it is run like a public board is a very large organization with the complexities of a federated model uh, that gives you a lot of training wheels for, a, for an independent board director seat. But anyhow, it took somebody like you to propose a candidate like me, right? And then you earn your way, of course, with capability, with the interview, with the delivery and performance. But it starts with just putting forward the candidates reaching out and thinking a little bit beyond your comfort level and tradition at network 
to give folks like me a chance. And guess what? When you are in the room of a non-for-profit or a board and deliver and perform, that is where we have to own up to our own performance, which I have done, then other opportunities come up. Now that I am in the Zoomies board, publicly traded global retailer, I get to nominate people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So with a few of the seats that have come up or are coming up to term, guess what? Everyone I have recommended is somebody that I feel is board ready or board capable that come from some of these groups and underrepresented segments, women as, as well as minorities. And I'm happy to report that they've been doing really well in all of those interviews. But if I hadn't put their name on the list, I don't think they would have been found. So intentionality. You know, that's what we've really done is to help executives, board directors, chairs, CEOs open the aperture, right? And say, Mm -hmm. okay, this person may not be in the C-suite, but they have the skills you need. And so you coming on to a large not-for-profit like the YMCA were observed by somebody who was chairing that board at the time who was on the publicly traded company that you're now on who said, hey, she's really good here (laughs) in this very complicated (laughs) and we need to put her on this uh, board. So that is how it happens, but it's being open-minded and understanding Mm -hmm. it's the skills that somebody can bring to the table, right? And that's what you've done. I want to just give a quick reminder to our audience that you are listening to The Power of Cultural Intelligence. Return on Inclusion with Lily Gil Valletta, CEO and co founder of CN Plus and Cultural Intel. The topics we cover, like today's, are all current, and a new topic with a new game changer is released every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. Now, let's return to Lily Gil Valletta. So, Lily, you're on a public board now and you understand corporations because you started in the corporate world before you became an entrepreneur. You spent over a decade at Johnson & Johnson, and your last role was as their director of global marketing services. So what opportunities did you see there in the corporate world that may be lacking where it prompted you to be bold and (laughs) do this, be an entrepreneur and co-found your businesses. Yes. Well, first of all, I love J&J and talking about company culture, I owe a lot of who I am and how I behave as a leader with my own organization uh, from that value-based credo mentality of J&J. So you read about it in MBA case studies and the Tylenol crisis and the J&J credo. And it's not just a thing hanging on the wall. It really is the filter for how we made decisions. And and I was schooled into that. So with that backdrop, right, I had the great opportunity to move quite fast in my career at J&J. But as a woman and as a Latina and as an immigrant, I took it upon myself to behave and act like an intrapreneur. So I think that matters a lot because sometimes we wait for others to create solutions or blame somebody somewhere, or a boardroom, or a C-suite title somewhere. Well, when I noticed that we had a very vibrant and amazing women's leadership organization, I was curious why we didn't have a Hispanic version of that, and took it upon myself to create and found it. Hola, which is the Hispanic Employee Resource Group of J&J. You can innovate and act like an entrepreneur even inside a company construct of a big corporation like J&J, right? Where I was um, encouraged and by watching other groups successfully run and galvanize the power of women, let's say with the Women's Leadership Organization, and then created my own. And in that journey, the reason why I left and a lot of people scratched their heads and I, I can now humbly and the older version of me pinches herself But I had an exit interview, Janice, with our CEO at the time, with Bill Weldon. And I remember Bill in his office asking me, Lily, what what can we do to keep you? And it, it got to the point when it wasn't about title or money. It was this bug of purpose that bit me when I realized that many more corporations were gonna need this inclusive perspective of business, how to run successful 
EBRGs that deliver on business value more so than a social club. And the fact that with shifting demographics right ahead of us, there was a great opportunity to help other companies tap into the power of culture and people to accelerate business. Um, So it got bigger than the title for me to go on and create the company I couldn't find to hire. That's so interesting. Here you created something internally, but then when you couldn't find the supplier to give you the information and consulting advice, (laughs) you went out and you built your own. So great, great lesson for everybody here. Do it internally. And if you see a real void, step into that void and create your own company. I love that story. This may be the reason why in 2022, you received the prestigious top 100 list award for being one of the most influential and notable Hispanic professionals in the technology industry, which there are not too many. And you're, you're in a league of your own. So but what, tell us what really has contributed to your success all along the way. And what would your advice be, particularly for diverse women leaders aspiring to follow such a career path? Well, I would break it in three parts. I love doing that because then my brain remembers it. (laughs) Number one, chase purpose and fulfillment over money. And that applies to entrepreneurs. I tell them all the time this. Why? Because there is no amount of money that will ever give you fulfillment and satisfaction. And I know that sounds cliche, And maybe that's why so many people are quitting their jobs with this great resignation we hear. But you have to love with conviction what you're doing. We spend too much time at work and giving our talents and brain power to it, whatever that job may be. Um, And to me, it was chasing that which has made it to this day so exciting and fulfilling. Now, the second thing is um, preparation and excellence. There's no shortcut for that. Um, I'll say this respectfully of my own community or, or diverse candidates because of the DNI pressures and maybe there's quotas in certain legislation somewhere or a dashboard to complete. And it may feel sometimes like, okay, I, I, I need to have that and I should have it and maybe a bit of an entitlement mentality. And yes, maybe your background gets you through the door. Maybe a mentor, let's say somebody like you who got me through the door at the YMCA board is needed. Absolutely. You can ask and demand that. But after that is on you. There's no shortcut to preparation and excellence. And that will dispel any myth, any stereotype or preconceived notion about, you know, who you are or where you come from, because results speak louder than anything else. So absolutely preparation is the second one. And then the third thing that to me is a key to success is surrounding yourself with people smarter than you. If you are the smartest person in the room, I feel that that's actually pretty dumb. (laughs) And that includes the mentors that surround you, the advisors and champions that advocate for you, the team and the leadership team that supports you as a leader. In my case, in a fast growing company now that I'm running with team members all over the country and the world. Janice, my focus has become in the last two years, especially with remote work and high growth, to build an extraordinary leadership team. So there you go. What really creates that success? And I feel that when I get the awards and the top 10 this and top 100 that is because of living by purpose, always performing with excellence and surrounding myself with people smarter than me. Lily, you know, you have many roles that you fill today. You're a wife, a mother of two young boys, a dear friend to me and many others, an entrepreneur, a commentator, busy with so many different projects, including continuing to build this phenomenal business. And you balance them all quite well, as I've seen. You always have time for people. And I understand you have a fundamental philosophy 
of feed the mind, but also fuel the soul. The consistency of honing your craft continuously to center yourself. But with all of these roles that you play in reaching out to others, helping them, building this business, how do you find the time to feed the mind and also fuel the soul? Running the risk of sounding a bit churchy. <laughs> Actually, my husband and I have a very simple philosophy that guides how we prioritize our focus and our time and mental bandwidth. And it's three F's, faith, family, and fun. And people often, when they hear us talk about faith, family, fun, they're like, wait, where is your work? Well, that's part of the fun. Because again, if it's purpose-filled and you're doing what you are meant to be doing in this world, it should be fun. But in that order, it really helps recalibrate how your days and weeks are structured. So, gosh, I think this is the first time, Janice, I'm going to share this, but on Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, I typically do a recalibration of the week. So kind of think about the week that has ended and how did I do in my faith, family, fun priorities and allocation of time. By the way, sometimes is great, sometimes is not. But I think just the consciousness of doing that self-check keeps you in check. And then the same way, and I did it last night, actually, I was on a plane and I was doing it for this week ahead, which I have a couple of travels coming up. Um, I looked at my calendar. Where is my time? I also looked ahead into when are the kids having half days because of Eastern or whatever, and proactively blocked times when I could because of that faith family fund priority order. However, it's not all rosy. There are days and weeks when I may be all in the fun and the fun of work category. And instead of self persecuting and giving myself a hard time for, oh my gosh, this week I'm not home and my kids are going to miss me. I know that I'm giving my hundred percent maybe this week to that fun part but I will flip it the next week, but it cannot be 200%. So it's knowing what the order is, being kind with yourself and knowing there may be a day when I am super mom and maybe my team has to wait on me a little bit or another week when it's the other way around, but I know what the priority is. And as long as that is being checked weekly, it helps with your own well-being and consciousness. And every single day, Janice, before I put my feet on the ground when the alarm sounds and I'm awake. And again, you know, I am unapologetically a believer and of Christian faith, etc. But whatever it is that you believe is that first breath when you open your eyes, just be grateful. It could take five minutes and that centers your soul. I'm alive. I'm breathing. It's a new day of opportunities, of impact, of health. Maybe there's challenges even that you're dealing with. It's okay, but you have that moment to reflect on the fact that you have the blessing of a new day. So it could be meditating, praying, whatever works for you. But I do do that every single day before looking at my phone, before getting distracted with my calendar, and it's just very centering. So That's some of the things that I do that kind of helps in the journey. Lily, this has been such an inspirational conversation from what you're doing to change cultures and companies by really showing them what people, customers are feeling about them and really helping organizations to helping yourself as an individual, which means you help others. And I've just learned something. I'm going to do that now, (laughs) reflecting on the past week, reflecting on the coming week, because it is true. One's life is never totally balanced. Any other words of wisdom you want to leave the audience with? Although I think we have so much (laughs) to (laughs) act on here. Back to cultural intelligence. My dream, Janice, is that cultural intelligence, which is a trademark we've held for now almost a decade. But my dream is that just as EQ has been embedded now into textbooks and MBAs and all that stuff, that cultural intelligence really becomes this elevated expression of leadership. IQ, EQ, and cultural intelligence added to that, I guess it would be CQ. 
Um, so my invitation to everyone listening is to recognize that without an inclusive approach to how you know and monitor your data, how you know and monitor your market trends, and how you decide and design the future of your business, without that, you'll be falling short. And I will stand in front of any CFO with financial models to prove it because the data doesn't work any other way. And I think that's exciting. And that's why we have these conversations. That's why you help leaders find talent that can maximize and leverage that potential of being aware of understanding and applying cultural competence and inclusive insights into your everyday business. So that's my challenge to all of you. Graduate from the altruistic bucket of diversity into it being an inclusive approach to growth, to impact, and shareholder value. Well, this has been truly a game-changing conversation, and I am in that camp with you to make sure that corporations really do enhance their cultures. And I believe leaders of today have really stepped up to the plate, risen to the occasion through the pandemic without a playbook. Thank you, Lily, for joining us today and sharing your very inspirational, informative, and exciting story. Thank you for joining in today to this game-changing conversation on Leadership Remap. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at elliggroup.com. Thank you for joining us today. Until our next episode, have a wonderful day.